And now another duet <laughs> with uh, Andrew Brown and Hervé Gournay about Robert Louis Stevenson and pleasure in an inland voyage. So Andrew Brown is a retired chartered accountant having worked with Ernst & Young in the UK, France and Belgium. He's lived in Belgium since 1979. He's a chairman of the Belgian Edith Cavill Commemoration Group that organized several events in Belgium and the UK between 2015 and 2019 to commemorate uh, the life and death during the First World War of Edith Cavill. He's a member of the Stevenson Club, the organization in the, steps, in the footsteps of Robert Louis Stevenson, the Marwell History Society and the Brussels International Singers Choir. He's working with the Marwell Society, History Society to establish a permanent RLS exhibition in the old lock house at Hachette near Marwell. And the main theme of this exhibition will be RLS's 1876 inland voyage. And Hervé Gournet is president of the Marwell History Society. Um, he's retired from the French railway company where he drove between Paris and Brussels legendary trains as the Trans Europe Express, which carried su such names as the Etoile du Nord and the Brabant. Am I, am I close enough to the microphone? Yeah. It reminds me of a moment uh, in, um, I had a lecturer at Edinburgh University who always started his lectures by asking if everyone could hear. And um, one of these occasions, a voice came from the middle of the hall and said, I can hear, but I'd be happy to ch change with someone who can't. <laughs> well, you have learned from the programme that Hervé Gourney and I are a team, and we have endeavoured to harness French intellect and Scottish pragmatism something that Robert Louis Stevenson would certainly have applauded. It's worth remembering or reminding ourselves that one of his favourite authors was Michel de Montaigne, a famous son of this city of Bordeaux. Hervé is an extremely active president of the Marwell History Society, of which I am a proud member, and another member, Patrick Antonio, will speak to us tomorrow. The previous speaker, Martin White, Robert Louis Stevenson and I have one common circumstance. We, were, we all hail from Edinburgh. But Martin, however, takes precedence over me as he in fact attended the same school as Stevenson. I live in Brussels, undoubtedly the capital of the acronym. So I have two on offer today. The first, AA, which does not in this case stand for Alcoholics Anonymous, even though my long-standing appreciation of Bordeaux's most delicious of products is far from being anonymous. Instead, AA hails me as an amateur admirer. I am indeed one of Stevenson's, of which there are many, and it is as such that I will talk of my impressions and sentiments on reading Stevenson's Inland Voyage, his first publicly published book which recounts his uh, canoe voyage from, by canoe from Antwerp to Pontoise, close by Paris, in 1876, along the rivers and canals of Belgium and northern France. His travel companion was his close friend, Walter Simpson, and their craft were two Rob Roy canoes designed by John MacGregor, a descendant of the Scottish hero Rob Roy MacGregor. Pleasure canoe travel in Europe in 1876 was in its infancy and as such was viewed with much astonishment and much amusement from onlookers on the river and canal banks who spied the two travellers. Robert Louis was introduced to the canoe by his friend Charles Baxter at Queen's Ferry on the Firth of Forth near Edinburgh. Walter Simpson's cousin, Robert, in his remembrance of Stevenson, in Rosaline Masson's 1922 collection, suggests that, and I quote, 
it did not take long to discover that RLS was an exceptionally interesting man and quite out of the range of ordinary mortals. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is a real pleasure for me to talk of, Rob, of Stevenson's pleasure in canoeing through Belgium and France. And this ordinary mortal will attempt to set out just how our hero handled his trip. I do not seek to describe the voyage in detail, but rather attempt to look at Stevenson's character and writing style at what was a very early moment in his literary career. For this task, I have devised a framework which takes me to my second acronym, OIP, O-I-P, Observation, Imagination and Philosophy. I have no hesitation in promoting that our favourite author derived great pleasure from travel and adventure, real and imagined, and it is no coincidence that the Stevenson Club's recent celebratory publication carries the title Fortunate Voyager. He undoubtedly gleaned pleasure planning of his unusual, somewhat rustic canoe voyage, and then by putting to paper his vivid recollections. The Inland Voyage is essentially a series of independent narratives or vignettes of the places and experiences encountered by our intrepid travellers. Stephen and delicately intertwines observation, imagination and philosophy in most of these. He observes the customs of the French populations encountered in the proximity of the rivers and canals. His, his descriptions are very precious and even unique in promoting an understanding of these Gallic waterside dwellers and their surroundings in 1876. He offers a commentary of the everyday happenings of everyday people. Human activity and the natural world are therefore what Stevenson deals with. Forests, animals, farmers, lock keepers, barge owners, soldiers, innkeepers, a religious community and travelling puppeteers. Stevenson's pleasures from his canoe adventure are multiple. Travelling in a simple fashion, the post, the reverie of the journey and the mulling over his chosen recollections, the putting to, of pen to paper and sculpting words into the most beautiful prose, the publication to share with others and, of course, the all-important financial reward. The canoe adventure affords Stevenson the opportunity to record many observations of the French populations living near the waterways at a time just after the Franco-Prussian War and some 35 years before the outbreak of World War I. He includes several observations on military activities. He shows a close interest in life around the river, the labourers and the lock staff and the sailors. He is forever conscious of the poor weather conditions that he experiences from the outset and which he mentions specifically in a letter sent to his mother from Compiègne. He also describes in much detail the natural world for which he has the greatest of admiration. As he paddles by the Mormal forest, his commentary would put him alongside the most ardent ecologists of our time. Then his description of Noyon Cathedral gives witness to his keen interest and curiosity. He is quite overwhelmed by this visit, but still finds himself obliged to gently make light of the religious community. And I quote, As for the choristers, from first to last they misbehaved as only boys can misbehave, and cruelly marred the performance with their antics. Stevenson was constantly plagued with poor health, a fact that encouraged him to imagine and dream of journeys and adventures that he might or might not have taken. His poems in A Child's Garden of Verses offer us clear evidence of this. On his inland voyage, while observing barge life on Belgium's Villebroek Canal, he remarks, It is a mystery how things ever get to their destination at this rate. 
and to see barges waiting their turn at a lock affords a fine lesson of how easily the world may be taken. Even when reading, Stevenson needs to let his imagination take over. As soon as the tale becomes in any way perspicuous, it lost all merit in my eyes. I have always been fond of maps and can voyage in an atlas with the greatest enjoyment, a pastime doubtless familiar to many of us. In several instances, Stevenson acclaims his admiration for those who are able to lead quiet, peaceful lives. He seeks the counterbalance to a world that has become more frenetic since the Industrial Revolution. His musings portray him as a thoughtful rather than a man of action, although he can at the same time be decisive. This is in contradiction to the activities of his grandfather and father, the great builders of lighthouses around the Scottish coasts. He demonstrates a refusal to conform with social norms and he defends his vocation as a writer against some resistance from his family and society in general. His canoe journey well portrays his determined search for the simple life of bare necessities in the open air. His love of freedom and independence puts him at odds with the well-heeled Edinburgh society of his time. He claimed atheism to shock his parents. He chooses a lady who's not yet divorced, and he eventually leaves his homeland to live in distant islands far from the puritanical British and American cities. His canoe experience is at the beginning of his travelling and writing lives, and is quite possibly the genesis of his own life's philosophy. The first verse of his poem, The Vagabond, could well have been inspired by his time on the rivers and canals of Belgium and France. Give to me the life I love. Let the lave go by me. Give the jolly heaven above and the byway night me. Bed in the bush with stars to see. Bread I dip in the river. There's the life for a man like me. There's the life forever. The Indian Voyage describes the places visited and folks encountered by Stevenson and Simpson. His book today can serve as a guide for travellers, as I myself as a witness when visiting three of these places, namely the Mormal Forest, Noyon Cathedral and the village of Précy. The River Sombre flows by the edge of the Mormal Forest, but nonetheless quite sufficient for our author to observe, imagine and offer some philosophical musings on the relationships between trees and us humans. Such a forest is most gratifying to sight and smell. I wish our way had always lain among woods. Trees are the most civil society. An old oak that has been growing where he stands since before the Reformation, taller than many spires, more stately than the greater part of mountains, and yet a living thing, liable to sicknesses and death like you and me. Is that not in itself a speaking lesson in history? For Stevenson, this place, offer, this place offers pleasurable odours, peace and dignity. He would have surely been saddened, perhaps angry, if he had known that some 38 years later, at the outbreak of the First World War, the same tranquil forest would serve as the hiding place for Allied soldiers fleeing the Battle of Mons, and it would lose about one third of its trees for the construction of trenches by the occupying forces. The Edith Cavill World One network first operated in and around the Mormal Forest. In 1914, the Allied retreat from Mons followed, in part, the same route as Stevenson's inland voyage. And according to John Charteris's biography, the British commander Douglas Haig 
read An Inland Voyage as escape literature. One has to assume that Haig, who was born in Edinburgh's Charlotte Square, had been introduced to Stevenson's writings in childhood. During the conflict, Haig spent a night in Marwell under the roof of the, Mor of the Maillard family. Today, the Mormal Forest has provided 12 oak trees for the rebuilding of the roof of Paris's Notre Dame Cathedral. In the little pictorial map of our whole inland voyage, which my fancy still preserves, Noyon Cathedral figures on a most preposterous scale. Stevens then sets out to regale his readers with details of the cathedral's structures and the powerful impression it left with him. Mankind was never so happily inspired as when it made a cathedral, a thing as single and specious as a statue at the first glance, and yet on examination as lively and interesting as a forest in detail. He observes, imagines and proposes some philosophical reflections on religion, the clergy and the worshippers, merely a few old women and old men. To visit Noyon Cathedral today without Stevenson's book is a mistake. His description of the exterior of this monumental edifice, as seen from his hotel bedroom window, is still clearly recognisable. He, re he imagines that the east end of the cathedral is the poop of a ship that battles through rough Atlantic waters. He was shown round by the sacristan. Today, today's guide could well be the church guardian, who is well appraised of Stevenson's visit and indicates proudly of the building where he stayed overnight. While inside the cathedral, Robert Louis states that you can never fathom how a man dares to lift up his voice to preach in a cathedral. I have never heard a sermon that was so expressive as a cathedral. Tis the best preacher and sets you preaching to yourself. And every man is his own doctor of divinity in the last resort. How interesting it is to note that a young 26-year-old was already capable of articulating such a mature existential view of humanity. Precy, a small town nestling next to the river Oise, just north of Pontoise and a neighbour to Chantilly, is in fact the last identified stopover of our water travellers. Stevenson describes it as being on a plain rich with tufts and poplar and on a wide curve of the Oise. He remarks that there was um, can I have some water? <laughs> he remarks that there was not a sound audible but that of the sheep bells in some meadows by the river and the creaking of a cart down the long road that descends the hill. Recently, this 21st century Scottish traveller spent a day and a night at Précy, where his lodgings, his lodging was a small hotel next to the River Oise. The restaurant terrace offered an uninhibited view of the river at a point where our 19th century traveller must surely have paddled by. The tufts and poplars are still to be observed, but they no longer bear witness to the peace and quiet of 1876. The air is now filled with the sounds of cars, motorbikes, aeroplanes, speed and cruise boats, as well as the discreet throb of the engines as the barges slip by, hardly disturbing the flat cam of the river. Observing such vessels, mostly transporting heavy materials such as sand and gravel, one is reminded of Stevenson's ob observation that there should be many contented spirits on board, for such a life is both to travel and to stay at home. He and Simpson found, find a bed and a meal 
at the inn in Précy, the worst inn in France, he claims. Not even in Scotland have I found worse fare. It was kept by a brother and sister, neither of whom was out of their teens. The selfsame inn is still in evidence today, boasts the name of Le Celtic, and is managed by a charming Turkish family. An RLS information plaque can be seen nearby. From this establishment, the village green and the church are in view, just as RLS describes them. Little has changed. In the evening, the two Scots attended a performance by a travelling puppet theatre. Such events are an integral part of France's holiday culture, as most certainly and most certainly reside in the memories of many of us. Stevenson tells us that the show people set out a number of benches, and all who sat upon them were to pay a couple of sous for the accommodation. He goes on to relate that there was a full house up until the moment that payment was requested. Then the benches emptied, and most of the folks stood around with their hands in their pockets. Ever was it thus, and he proposes it certainly would have tried an angel's temper. Stevenson and Simpson decided to end their inland voyage two days later on reaching Pontoise. It was time for them to get back to the world. To the civilised man, there must come sooner or later a desire for civilization. After Pontoise, RLS made his way to Barbizon, near Fontainebleau, where he met up with Fanny, his future wife. After leaving Compiègne, nearing the end of the voyage, Stevenson inserts a chapter, Changed Times, wherein, with much pleasure, he looks back to some memorable moments of this canoe voyage. At this stage in the tale, the travellers leave behind the rural lands to be replaced by the larger river Oise and larger populations. We now lay in towns where nobody troubles us with questions. We are floated into civilised life where people pass without salutation. In sparsely inhabited places, we make all we can of each encounter. But when it comes to a city, we keep to ourselves and never speak unless we have trodden on a man's toes. Now that social contacts are more rare, life seems less interesting to Stevenson. And here is one reason of a dozen why the world is dull to dull persons. The chapter, this chapter is preparing for the end of the adventure. A certain ennui has set in and they have even stopped reading. There are, however, several amusing commentaries on everyday life. Probably the table has more devotees than love, and I am sure that food is much more generally entertaining than scenery. To detect the flavour of, of an olive is no less a piece of human perfection than to find beauty in the colours of the sunset. He remembers the pleasurable time spent with the barge workers, and claims that canoeing was easy to work. The days spent on the waterways gave Stevenson the opportunity to abstract himself from daily life and enjoy the holiday without disturbance, like a government office. His reveries permitted him some almost out-of-body experiences, being as near nirvana as would be convenient in practical life. He found this state the most agreeable. And I quote, It may be best figured by supposing yourself to get dead drunk and yet keep sober to enjoy it. He then concludes that this frame of mind was the great exploit of our voyage. Take it all in all. It was the furthest piece of travel accomplished. Last year, the French Inland Waterways Authority reopened the Sambre Canal. This initiative once more enables tourist boats 
to navigate from Antwerp to Pontoise and beyond. Many local authorities and various organisations are now planning to publicise the Stevenson Canoe Voyage as a tourist attraction in some rather beautiful countryside, a fine example being the region of the Avenois. One of the many locks encountered by Stevenson and Simpson was at Hachette, next door to Marroil, where the original lock house still exists and houses probably the only remaining pumping machine on continental Europe built by another Scot, James Watt. Next year, the Marwell Commune will open a small museum in this lock house where Robert Louis Stevenson, James Watt and others will be celebrated. 2026 will mark the 150th anniversary of the Inman Voyage, creating thus an opportunity to organise a series of celebratory events along the route. There is already a Stevenson cycle route that boasts a large tourist panel on the French A26 motorway just south of Saint-Quentin and close to Alincourt. There is, of course, another great Scottish literary Robert, Robert Burns. And I'd like to end by quoting the last two lines of his epitaph to a friend, written possibly about a hundred years before Stevenson. Stevenson would almost certainly have read this epitaph, and I submit that these two lines could well have been attributed to Robert Louis Stevenson. If there's another world, he lives in bliss. If there is none, he made the most of this. Thank you. <laughs>